Thank you very much for, for being here uh, this morning. Um, our, our guest is, as you know, uh, Ambassador Valentin Insko, who is a well-known uh, well uh, Austrian diplomat. And um, I think this is of particular interest uh, to those of you that took part in a study trip to Sarajevo uh, from 2009 to 2021. He served as the UN High Representative in Bosnia-Herzegovina and simultaneously uh, as a EU Special Representative. And I, and I hope uh, Ambassador Insko can maybe tell us a little bit about this rather peculiar role wearing two hats uh, at the same time, which is one of the peculiarities or was at the time of, of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Insko has been involved in Southeast uh, uh, European diplomacy since 1981, when he joined the Austrian Foreign Ministry and began working for the department responsible for relations with, uh, with the region. He was assigned to the Austrian Embassy in Belgrade from 1982 to 1986, and in 1992 headed the OS, OSCE mission uh, in Saint-Jacques, uh, an interesting uh, little region in, in, uh, in the, exactly. And from 1996 to 1999, Insko served as the first resident Austrian ambassador to Bosnia-Herzegovina, and in this capacity was responsible for establishing the Austrian Embassy in Sarajevo. Based in Vienna, from 1999 to 2005, Insko headed the Austrian Foreign Ministry Department responsible for Central, Eastern and Southern uh, Europe, as well as Central Asia and the Southern Caucasus. From 2005 to 2009, he was Austrian ambassador to the Republic of Slovenia. Now, before uh, joining the Foreign Ministry, Insko held senior positions with the UN Development Programme missions in uh, Mongolia and Sri Lanka. His other diplomatic postings have included serving at the Austrian mission to the, to the United Nations and as deputy chairman of the UN Disarmament Commission in New York. Moreover, he is a member of the board of the Vienna Economic Forum, a member of the board of the Vienna-based Institute for the Danube region and Central Europe, which I think are particularly interesting, and the head of the Council of Corinthian Slovenians, because... As I'm sure the ambassador may say, uh, you are a Corinthian Slovenian uh, by background. Uh, he has an original sin, and that is that he studied law uh, and uh, languages also, and that I suppose forgives him, at Graz University and at the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna, which I'm sure many of you know. Now, before giving a warm welcome to Ambassador Insko, I was thinking this morning, imagining somebody sat in my seat in 50 years time obviously i imagine the pentas will be modernized and so on and so forth and i would rather like the i like the idea that maybe one or more of you will have in 50 years time a bio like ambassador insco because you know that's for many of you the reason why you've come to size to this uh, uh, school of advanced international studies so um that's my uh, that's my hope. And of course, uh, as you know, the title of uh, Ambassador Insko's uh, uh, talk this morning, he'll talk for the usual 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll uh, open for questions. 50 years in diplomacy, 20 years in the Balkans, lessons learned, no slides. So this is going to be a, a conversation in many respects. The floor is yours. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Frosini. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and um, for the first time, but it's not for the first time that I speak to SAIS or Johns Hopkins. I spoke to uh, your alumni association in Vienna. I um, also spoke in Baltimore, but especially in Washington, I think I had about 10 lectures or so because uh, based on my duty as High Representative in Bosnia-Herzegovina, I had to report to the Security Council every six months about the progress in the country. And so I went also every six months to Washington. And uh, every time there was Johns Hopkins, you know, and uh, of course I must say, uh, there was no Bologna in Washington, but there was Milano. There's a good restaurant, you know. <laughs> it's called Milano, a restaurant, the ultimate place to see and to be seen, yeah and uh, a place where most powerful people go. It's also very expensive, yeah. But, um, oh, we also went to the Tabard Inn, 
which was in walking distance uh, from the uh, size, you know, in, uh, I think they are getting now a new building, or isn't it? Yeah, ah, could be. yeah. so they have to also to relocate the Tabard Inn maybe, or Milano, but in any case, uh, there I was a regular, a regular, a regular guest, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking about international career, I had first uh, a job offer with Chase Manhattan Bank uh, in Moscow because of my language skills, yeah. Uh, but I would say, fortunately, uh, somebody later, a few weeks later, recruited me for United Nations Development Program. And um, I was sent to Mongolia because of my Russian again. It was a second, in a way, second language in Mongolia in the 70s, yeah. And I served there for the United Nations Development Program. Ladies amongst you will appreciate the Mongolian Kashmir and Mohair products, yeah? uh, but we also established the Gobi National Park. The Austrian Foreign Service, um, and I went also to Sri Lanka for UNDP, and what was quite pleasant to the Maldives, you know, this was our sub office. <laughs> we had to expand the airport because the island, the airport was so small. So we prolonged the airport and the island to allow bigger planes to come, yeah. Then, um, I worked uh, as a 81, as you said, for the Austrian Foreign Service. My first job was in Belgrade after Tito's death in 82. And uh, later I was reassigned to uh, New York as deputy chairman, as you said, for the Disarmament Commission, which is not such an important body as the Disarmament Conference was more important in Geneva. Yeah, But uh, I could see Mr. Gorbachev speaking. President Reagan speaking, you know, and Gorbachev also made his famous speech on the 7th December of 87 about disarmament, uh, major cuts in Soviet uh, armament and along the Eastern Europe and the Chinese uh, border. So this was quite a historic speech. And I think Russia then was uh, happy to have such a president because the disintegration of Soviet Union was peaceful um, uh, thanks to him. You also have heard the famous words of President Reagan, tear down this wall, uh, the Iron Curtain. And I was personally present when our foreign minister cut the barbed wire be between Czech Republic and Austria. Yeah, uh, This was quite a moving, um, moving moment. Yeah. Uh, in Prague, where I worked uh, then, um, I established the Austrian Cultural Center. So being diplomat, don't reject cultural jobs also. Uh, it's very interesting. You will meet the most fascinating people in culture, like the French uh, cultural attaché in Prague, Poivre d'Avor, yeah? also a, a writer. And his, his brother, I think, was TV5. He presented books, etc. Yeah? In any case, you meet uh, fascinating people. I met, for example, also Václav Havel and translated one of his books into Slovenian, The Power of the Powerless, because he was a dissident. Yeah? Um, and... Um, so uh, don't reject if you have in a foreign ministry the offer to work in culture. Of course, not the whole life, but say 10 years, five years, whatever. Uh, if you will eat the Cultural uh, Institute or Alliance Francaise, whatever, the British Council <clears throat> in big cities, it's, it's quite a task. And you meet really fascinating people there because uh, in culture, you find fascinating people there. So in the Czech Republic, uh, there was a different issue also. They suggested me in a way, not Austria, but then together for the job of high representative. And it was um, uh, Prince and Count um, Schwarzenberg, who was foreign minister. He uh, presented me as a candidate for this job. And it was quite important that the Czechs suggested me because they were the presidency country of European Union uh, in 2009. Again, Prague, I got uh, for one reason, I speak also the Czech language, and um, it's quite important to learn as many languages as possible. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, as we're learning an eighth language now, yeah. Italian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also the second mother tongue of my wife, she's from Argentina, you know. I have to tackle Spanish also. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, William Burns, you know, the director of CIA. Um, he's one of the most outstanding diplomats for me, uh, scholars senior government officials, the most outstanding I ever met, you know, he said the following, yeah, um, that in, today wor in today's world of digital and virtual relationships, there is still no alternative to old-fashioned human interaction, yeah, not in business, in romance, of course, also, or diplomacy. More than half a century ago, uh, there was one CBS uh, journalist who joined Foreign Service, the State Department, and uh, Bill Burns is quoting uh, 
him. He said, the really critical link in the international communications chain is the last three feet. The last three feet, which is best bridge by personal contact. One person taking, talking to, uh, to other person. And of course, without translator, yeah, is the best if you speak yeah. the language. Like Bill, uh, Bill Burns, uh, the current director of CIA, he speaks Arabic, he speaks Russian, and of course, all other normal languages like French and Italian, I don't know what, yeah, but also uh, Russian and Arabic. And he said how important it is uh, to speak languages for the last three feet uh, during negotiations, yeah. Because diplomats provide a critical link, whether it's in relationships uh, to leaders, uh, in economy, but also securing the safety of citizens. Many times a diplomat has to go to a crisis area and negotiate uh, if there is a hostage or whatever. And of course it helps if you, if you know the language. But now to the lessons learned. Yeah? First lesson actually is don't leave a mission if the job is not finished. You have to finish the job, yeah? We have seen so many times that one country helped another country, but left too early. Uh, it's a mistake. You have to stay, yeah? And uh, we can think about Afghanistan. <clears throat> and uh, of course, Americans left, but there was General Mark Milley and Marine Corps General Kenneth McKenzie. They suggested to leave behind some 2,500 soldiers. And I'm sure there would be a difference for the women of Afghanistan if there would be a foreign presence, yeah? So uh, the first lesson, uh, make the job uh, until the end and don't, don't leave too early. Yeah? And we should not be ash ashamed to stay long. Like uh, Allied forces in Germany, they stayed for 45 years and Germany had a limited sovereignty. So it was important to consolidate Germany. There was a lot of Nazism, like in Austria, in my country. Yeah? In our country, uh, there was a state treaty in 55, so Allied forces stayed only for 10 years because we had already a functioning uh, democracy, a blossoming economy, etc., with Marshall Plan, yeah? Uh, but uh, if you take um, Japan, yeah, and South Korea, the Americans are still there. I think it's now 78 years, yeah? And of course, we know why they're there. It's because of North Korea, yeah? And there are 30,000 in South Korea, including families and 30,000 in um, Japan, also including uh, families. So it's important not to go leave a country too early. Yeah? It is like to take away a life belt from a child. If it cannot swim, don't take it away. Or if you take away from somebody crutches or the wheelchair, the person can collapse and also countries can collapse if you leave too early. Yeah? Second lesson, frozen conflicts don't stay frozen forever. This, of course, every diplomat is happy that there's a frozen conflict. You do just nothing. You go to cocktail parties, yeah? But a frozen conflict can always break out. Take Nagorno-Karabakh, yeah, uh, in 2020. Um, it stopped, this breakout stopped with a trilateral treaty with Russia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Take the Hezbollah rockets two years ago, and even now also, of course, in Israel, yeah? Uh, or take the Lebanon tensions, it can break out anyway. Even in Cyprus, we never know. But of course, for diplomats, it's most cozy and comfortable. If there's a frozen conflict, you have to do nothing. But I think a preventive diplomacy is a good diplomacy when you work on a frozen conflict. Yeah? My point is that it does not remain frozen uh, forever. Also, third lesson, you cannot avoid confrontation forever. Because this is also um, with diplomats, we are paid optimists, you know, and we uh, think if we avoid a confrontation, we will be the, the nice guy. We will be remembered as the nice guy and so on, you know, uh, because we avoided confrontation. And it, myself also, uh, I did it uh, initially, I avoided confrontation. Yeah. However, I developed for myself a strategy and it was not a methodology, not confrontational, but still, to um, be strong and to stick to my own standpoint and opinion. I have learned in my life that it's many times very good just to be factual, just to be factual, to go down to facts. And of course you have to have no history, you know, whenever you go to any foreign country, prepare yourself well, because once you're in the country, 
four years will pass quickly. Yeah. So uh, factual, if you have figures, you know, and facts, and do it without emotions, many times you can solve a conflict because conflicts also cannot be avoided forever. This, of course, is uh, our policy. We are we are pretending that everything is all right, you know, but we are dishonest to ourselves. Uh, a conflict will not. Uh, we have really to go head on uh, with conflicts and not not avoid them. Another lesson is stay ahead of developments. Yeah, don't discover the trend because once you discover the trend, most probably it's over. Yeah, you have to uh, be ahead of of developments. And of course, now everybody's speaking about uh, climate changes and so on. But the future issues will be trans-Pacific partnerships, transatlantic trade and investment partnership. It will be about uh, energy, et cetera, yeah? But stay ahead of the trend. Now, very important, also another lesson. Don't negotiate without a fleet uh, behind you, yeah? And uh, you are being also British. It was Lord Thorington, uh, the Earl of Thorington, yeah? Naval Commander Arthur Herbert in 1690. In 1690, he said, when you negotiate, you need a fleet behind you. Yeah? This fleet, of course, has maybe no cannons. Yeah? It's a bluff. Of course, in diplomacy, you also need bluffs sometimes. Yeah? So the fleet behind you uh, is scary for your, for your enemy. Yeah? And this fleet behind you is maybe usually staying in the harbor. Yeah? But you have a fleet behind you. You cannot... You cannot negotiate <clears throat> without force, uh, without being strong. Yeah? And professor, maybe I have a suggestion for you, or you did it anyway. There is a fantastical historical books uh, written by Thucydides, Thucydides yeah? about the Peloponnesian War. And in this book you have, book five, you have chapter 17, the Melanian Dialogue. Melanian Dialogue, yeah. It's very, very famous, yeah. Uh, and famous sentences, we are not like, like, um, like Tukidides said, I'm not writing this book for applause or for the moment, but um, I write it for the possession for many generations to come. Yeah. In any case, um, the millennials, which were a small uh, island, you know, argued. There was this fight between Sparta and, um, and Ath Athens, yeah. And Athens wanted to take possession. Of, of millennials of the island, yeah. So they were uh, arguing that they have international law behind them, you know, um, the law of the nations. They said, yeah, they had the right to be neutral between, they said, between uh, Sparta and, and Athens, yeah. Um, and um, they didn't attack uh, Athens, yeah. They were not a provocateur, yeah. And they wanted to have a free state. Uh, Melos was a free state for 700 years, yeah, and they just wanted to stick to the free state, you know, and they were not ready to give up, up freedom. We know who is repeating it now on a daily basis. We are not ready to give up our freedom, yeah, in Eastern Europe, yeah. So the Melanian dialogue is really a fantastic, yeah, but of course this was a small island. Athens sent uh, generals to negotiations and ultimately uh, this, uh, this uh, small place uh, which didn't give in, but uh, they dis it disappeared because they were crushed by the by the uh, at, uh, by Athens. Yeah. So if you like to negotiate, you have to have a fleet a fleet uh, behind you. Yeah. You have to be well prepared, and um, you have to negotiate from a, a position of strength, uh, at least uh, legal strength. Yeah. If you don't have a big army, you legal strength. Yeah. Now, another lesson, don't just analyze a problem because we diplomats are very good in analyzing the problems, yeah? And we overanalyze, yeah? And we are so good and so smart, you know, in analyzing problems. Offer a solution. Because we uh, senior diplomats are rather cautious than imaginative, but you have to use your imagination. Don't say why it won't work. Find a solution. Don't wait instruction for instructions, but be in touch with your headquarters and they will send instructions which you produced, yeah? Which you told them, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, and don't just be an optimist. We are diplomats, are paid optimists. It's the original quote by Valentin Insko. We are paid optimists, you know? 
This is what we diplomats many times are. <laughs> As they would say, after every meeting, if you read the report, I had a good meeting with Stalin. I had a good meeting with Hitler, you know, like Neville Cher uh, Chamberlain. Yeah, He brought peace for our times. Yeah, And uh, with Idi Amin and uh, Gaddafi, I had a good meeting, you know. He promised cooperation. When the Balkans, they look into your eyes, they lie to you, and they would say, we will cooperate. Yeah. And you leave the door, you close the door, they're already telling something else. Yeah? In the Balkans, there's another uh, funny issue. Uh, there's the word wisdom. Is anybody speaking here Russian or Serbian? Yeah. Mudrost, 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 yeah. Mudrost is wisdom, yeah. But arch wisdom is cheating. And we from the West, uh, we come, oh, Mudrost, yeah. Not Mudrost is cheating, you know, but we think it's wisdom. It's uh, honest people, you know, they use wisdom. But the, the word arch, arch wisdom means cheating. So if you're a foreign diplomat in the Balkans, <laughs> you have to learn this word also. And another word is a spite, of course. People are using spite uh, without reason, just to be against, you know. Okay. Um, then uh, also very important for young diplomats, deliver ideas. Deliver ideas. You as a junior diplomat, you're an attaché, you are nobody. But sooner or later, they will be noticed. Good ideas will be noticed, you know. Uh, I have some good ideas, for example. Um, there are, uh, the Erasmus project is not very well known, but I would introduce Erasmus Balkans, yeah. Or the Arte television program is well known. I would introduce Arte Balkans because it's also the same language there. Serbian, Montenegrinian, Bosnian, Croatian is the same language, but of course it has different names. Like we were considering in Austria to call our language Austrian, or they call it Switzerdeutsch, uh, Schweizerdeutsch, yeah. Schweizerdeutsch. With German, yeah. So everybody would understand Arte Balkans, or just copy paste the German French reconciliation model. Don't invent new models, just copy paste, you know, with use exchange, etc., etc. The biggest two enemies in Europe. The Prussian French War, First World War, Second World War, the biggest enemies are now the biggest pillars of cooperation uh, in Europe. Yeah. So uh, deliver ideas. Another quite good lesson which I learned is speak the truth, reject wishful, uh, wishful thinking, push back. Usually, when the ambassador would say something, we agree with the ambassador in morning meetings, you know. But we have to tell them about the ambassador, you are wrong. Like I told the Austrian ambassador in Prague, Czechoslovakia will disintegrate. I had the experience from Yugoslavia. I could feel it in my veins, you know. Yeah. He said, oh, Valentin is uh, very emotional, he said. And he rejected my idea. But three months later, he said, we in the embassy are changing our policy. Czechoslovakia will disintegrate peacefully, of course, yeah? But speak out if you have a good idea and speak the truth, even if it's against the boss, even if against, it's against the minister, doesn't matter. The minister would come on a visit, you know, he would go into the embassy and speak to the staff. Tell the truth if you have, if you have some other opinion, you know? So very important, yeah? And uh, like the, the Finnish embassy, the Finnish embassy predicted that Ayatollah Khomeini would win. And they had only seven diplomats, the Finns, in Tehran. But the big American embassy with 400 diplomats, they said, there's a secret service of the shark, you know. They have the big army, etc. cetera. Uh, the Ayatollah cannot win. But he did. So you have to give your opinion if you think it is right. And of course, you have to, you have to uh, um, uh, substantiate it also and to, to say why, yeah. Also, to be, to be uh, honest, you know, and truthful, sometimes you have to maybe go away from your ministry. Many American diplomats left after the Iraqi war. I think also the Brits, they were speaking about non-existence of chemical weapons. Later, everybody knew it was, it was a big blunder of Tony Blair, yeah. Chemical weapons didn't exist, yeah. But for example, one who didn't agree with the Balkan policy of Germany, a minister, he left his job, it was short shilling. Later he became high representative, yeah, like me. Uh, but he was minister of postal affairs and he was quite successful because he privatized the postal system in Germany or the telecom, etc. Yeah. Short shilling resigned. 
There was also a special rapporteur for the Balkans for human rights, Tadeusz Mazowiecki, you know him, the first democratic prime minister of Poland. Uh, he resigned from his UN job because he said there was a massacre in, in, in Bosnia, there was genocide. They didn't listen to him, so, um, so he resi resigned, yeah. And um, there are many other examples, but anyway, uh, speak truthful, truthfully and also re resign if necessary, if you cannot reconcile the situation and the uh, instructions with your uh, conscience. But of course, short of resignation, officers are, are obliged to exercise discipline and avoid public dissent. But they also have a parallel obligation to express their concern internally and offer their best policy advice, even if the truths they perceive are inconvenient. A small advice to you also. And now the next one, um, accept risk and uh, accept hardship posts. Uh, go to Islamabad or earlier, go to Afghanistan, go to Sarajevo, go to diff difficult posts, yeah? It will be rewarded. People will remember, he, this guy was in Libya, he was in Baghdad, you know, now he goes to Paris or wherever, you know. But when you are young, go to um, difficult posts and don't hide behind embassy wars. This is also a, a pleasant uh, game of young diplomats be, to hide behind the embassy wars. It's so cozy, nothing can happen, you know. But if you don't go out, you will never know what the situation is on the ground, yeah. Of course, I wish we could ensure zero risk, but we cannot, yeah. So take hardship posts as well, especially at the beginning of your career. Another observation, remain optimistic, yeah. And um, I think it's, it's, it's great, uh, like Roosevelt said, um, it's great to work hard and uh, to work something what is worth doing. So this gives Roosevelt, gave Roosevelt optimism, yeah. But of course, the most popular thing for a minister for the yellow press is to say, we have budget cuts in a ministry. Yeah? Everybody minister likes to announce budget cuts and he will get applause from the yellow press, but only for one day. And the next day we will, uh, he will have a problem when he has to send people somewhere where, the, where there's a catastrophe, where you need people, he will have no people, you know. Hmm. Our service is very, very fascinating. It's about innovative economy. It's about the exchange of people. Uh, we have values which uh, we are defending and um, we are diverse and a mobile population in the ministries. Yeah? And I think in the foreign ministries, there are still the best people. The, this state departments and foreign ministries att attract the best people uh, available. I must say also in my observation coming from a small country, I have never seen an incompetent British diplomat. I don't know what the procedure is. Uh, yeah, maybe he Looking can. Over, that's Michael Lee. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he doesn't, but they're all well educated. Maybe the assessment is wrong, yeah? But usually a French and a British diplomat uh, have good schools. They're well educated, you know, they're good diplomats. And, um, but anyway, um, Usually they're well educated and uh, education should also include culture. I mentioned it earlier, it should not be underestimated. Yeah, And uh, the typical good diplomat is a patriot, of course, he's well educated, uh, he is generous. And Warren Buffett said generosity pays yeah, in business, but also in diplomacy. Yeah, And he is hardworking. Yeah? In short, a good diplomat represents his country in an ideal way. Now uh, I will finish my talk with um, with a focus on Bosnia, on the Balkans, yeah, and I will start with, um, with some information which will shock you or you will be delighted, but in any case you will not expect it, yeah. My theory is that Bosnia, the small Bosnia of four million people, now it has three million, is the biggest exporter of politicians in the world, honestly the biggest exporter, like the new minister, Australia has a new government, yeah? The new minister for industry is Edhem Husic. If you look uh, in, in the inter internet, yeah, Edhem Husic is the new minister of industry in Australia. The minister of education in Sweden, she was 28, was Aida Haji Alic. Aida Haji Alic, who is 27 years, also a Bosnian refugee. 
She resigned, however, because she drank a beer, you know, and one beer uh, is allowed in Sweden, but she said, I am um, Minister of Education, I must be a good example for the young people, yeah? So she resigned. And in Bologna, uh, 0 0.2 per mil is allowed in Sweden, and she had 0 0.2 per mil, yeah? In Bologna, in the streets, is 0 0.2 per mil because of the wine, isn't it, yeah? <laughs> but she resigned. Aida Haji Alic is now in the City Council of Stockholm, and she will come back. She was 27 when she was minister. She will come back, you know. Then uh, Baroness Armin Kahelic. Armin Kahelic is in the House of Lords. She um, is a refugee child also of, and she, um, she observed a Balkan wisdom. What is better, sunshine or rain? Yeah. In the Balkans, rain is better because after rain comes sunshine. Yeah. So uh, she went to the shadow foreign minister, and the name of the shadow foreign minister was William Hague. So after rain came sunshine, and she was a private secretary of William Hague, who suggested her for the House of Lords, yeah? Armin Kahelic. Or the most brilliant example um, is Alma Zadic, the Minister of Justice in Austria. Uh, she graduated from primary school in the basement in Tuzla. It's a salt city. Uh, Tuzla is salt in Turkish. Yeah? She is now, uh, but Alma Zadic uh, studied at the close uh, University of Piacenza. She studied at Columbia University. She studied at Vienna University. And she is at the moment the most popular politician in Austria, yeah, after the president. We have a very, very good president in Austria, Van der Bellen, yeah. But uh, the next one is Alma Zadic. And um, the question in the opinion polls is not popularity, but trust. Do people trust a minister? And they trust Alma Zadic. And she has a difficult job. She's Minister of Justice, you know, and she's very tough. She's very fundamental, and she goes back to the roots, even to Roman law, yeah? So she gets uh, admiration uh, from uh, everybody. There are also about four deputies in the Deutsche Bundestag from Bosnia. And there are two or three in the Österreichian parliament, uh, also from Bosnia. So um, they are a big uh, exporter of talents and politicians, yeah. Now, in Bosnia, we had a grueling war. I could speak about history, but I will not just one, maybe one issue. I still met the last attentator of Sarajevo. You know, uh, the attentat happened on the 28th of June, 1914, but there were five of them. They all, everybody had a grenade and everybody could have killed the emperor. I mean, the next emperor, Franz Ferdinand, yeah, the heir. But uh, once he was dead by Gavrilo Princi, there was no need to, to kill him once <laughs> again, yeah? So one of them was Vasa Čubrilović. He was 17 years old, 17, and he died only 1990, in 1990. Uh, he was 93 when he died, and I met him in Belgrade, and he was very proud of being a freedom fighter, he said. He didn't want to hear that he was a terrorist, yeah? But he had the grenade in his hand also, yeah? So Vasa Čubrilović, I don't want to speak about history, but uh, the last year, as the last war had 100,000 people killed, 100,000. And uh, it was then after the massacre of Srebrenica that international troops intervened, especially the Americans. And uh, there was then peace uh, imposed upon Bosnia in Dayton, the Dayton Peace Agreement. It, and it was uh, Richard Holbrook. Yeah? However, this Dayton Peace Agreement in reality didn't function so easily because there was nothing, you know, there were only three ministries. Now we have nine, yeah? So there was no border police, nothing, nothing, yeah? There was no common currency. We did it, of course, later. There was no common passport, no uh, flag. It's now yellow and blue, like Ukraine or like European Union, yeah? But we had to impose it because everybody wanted to have his own symbols, yeah? The chessboard of the Croats, you know, the eagles of the of the Serbs and the lily of, of the Bosniaks, yeah? Uh, so we created a new flag, uh, and we created a new currency based on the Deutsche Mark. We created the convertible mark, yeah? But we only could do it with bond powers because first two years there were no bond powers, yeah? And we created in a meeting in Bonn under the chairmanship of Klaus Kinkel, uh, they created the bond powers, executive powers. So now you can impose a law, impose a symbol, national anthem, whatever, yeah? We still have no lyrics, but we have a melody. Like in Spain, yes, there, are no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are no lyrics, you know, uh, because of, you know. And, and, and so on, uh, uh, these bomb powers were used 800 times, usually for legal issues, but also for uh, removing nasty politicians. 
we removed 200. Lord Ashdown, who was using bomb powers the most, removed on one Friday, it was Black Friday, 59 politicians yeah, on one day, but altogether 200, amongst them also three state presidents, not just mayors, you know, small politicians from the parliament, no, but uh, also three state presidents, presidents because they were uh, violating uh, Dayton Treaty, they were glorifying war criminals, whatever, I don't know, yeah, uh, so these bomb powers can be used by the high representative. I was number seven. I have um, a successor now. He is um, from Germany. He was minister of uh, agriculture in Germany, and he is now high representative, uh, Mr. Mr. Schmidt. Yeah. So uh, my advice for Bosnia-Herzegovina, also Cyprus and South Korea, of course, we have to have a long-term approach unless everything is consolidated. Then we, then we can leave, of course. And we also have to use the instruments at our disposal, be it European Union instruments, you know, I was really uh, EUSR special representative also for two years. We introduced visa-free travel, and it was really a big holiday, philharmonic concerts, everything, you know, because people were so happy that they could travel again freely. Yeah? So uh, they have instruments, but in Bosnia, we have four concrete instruments, you know. In the constitutional court, we have three, uh, foreign judges sitting. Of course, we don't want to influence them, but we like the to keep the foreign judges. Otherwise, the constitutional court would be just a joke, you know. Uh, then we have UFOR, International Peacekeeping Forces. We have the Birchko supervision. Birchko is a district. Uh, we have Birchko supervision and arbitration of Birchko. And of course, we have the high representative. Yeah. What we also should do in the Balkans, but especially in Bosnia, we should brutally pursue and implement rule of law. But not just, you know, these guys are very smart. They adopt a new law, but it's never implemented. Like new war crime strategy. It was adopted, the war crime strategy. But if you ask them after 10 years, how many people uh, you have put into prison, war criminals? Not a single one. So don't believe if a politician will tell you, ah, Mr. Insko, we have a new law on this and this, you know, uh, on corruption, on whatever, you know, conflict of interest. You, you ask them, how many people have you already removed because of conflict of interest? Don't just believe that there is a new law, you know, yeah. Um, copy paste Franco-German policy, I already said so, yeah. Well, a crazy idea which I uh, uh, addressed Brussels these days, a crazy idea is, to have a Eurozone in the Balkans immediately, immediately. Uh, why? These are such small countries, nobody would notice, yeah? The GDP of, uh, of Montenegro is maybe the GDP of, of Berlin, it's nothing. But they have uh, Euro anyway. Kosovo has a Euro also. So why not introduce it also in Bosnia or elsewhere in Macedonia? Bosnia actually is strictly pegged to the Euro. So there is no inflation, or if there is inflation, it's the same inflation like in Eurozone, you know, because it's two to one, strictly two yeah. to one, yeah, to have a Eurozone, for example, yeah. Um, also, uh, my last, uh, my last um, maybe idea about uh, Austria, Slovenia, Croatia, uh, even Czech Republic, our security starts in the Balkans, our security. So it's in our own egoistic interest to have stability, have security in the Balkans, you know. Notice uh, Molebeck attentat, the Bataclan in Paris, the attentat in Vienna, all weapons came via the Balkans. You have human trafficking, you have drugs trafficking, you have weapons trafficking. So it's in our interest uh, to have stability, rule of law uh, and peace. Yeah. yeah, and the last uh, question, which I like to answer immediately, um, why the Balkan has such, such bad luck, you know. I think there's a huge responsibility of leaders, of leaders. Imagine Nelson Mandela after 27 years in prison, he would come out and say, now we have the hour of revenge. There would be a bloodbath, you know. Like in Zimbabwe, Mugabe, there was no bloodbath, but he ruined the economy. He ruined Rhodesia and uh, Zimbabwe. It was a blossoming economy. It depends on one, lead, one leader. Or South Korea, there was bitter poverty. Ban Ki-moon told me they had $30 per capita per year in South Korea in, after the war, you know, uh, income. But now it's a successful country. 
or it's quite interesting when he died about five or six years ago, Lee Kuan Yew, the Singapore leader, father of Singapore, during his first press conference when Singapore was a state, I think it's now 60 years or 58 years, he cried, he cried because they got just as a piece of territory, a swamp, you know, there was nothing. But one leader can make a big change, you know. And um, Gorbachev, I mentioned earlier, peaceful dissolution, etc. There's a great, great responsibility. And of course, there's also the uh, civil society, which has an important role to play. But in some regimes, you know, like North Korea or today's maybe Russia, there's only a limited scope for the civil society. Or in Iran, there's a limited scope, yeah. But anyway, uh, if you are lucky with political leaders like France, like Germany after the war, like my country after the war, you are lucky. And hopefully such days will come also uh, to the Balkan states. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Insko. Okay, right. Well, without further ado, who's going to break the ice? I thought it might be Nick. I think I've won a little bet here. Yeah. Okay, Nick, as as with everyone, to say where you're from, uh, name and where you're from. Good morning. My name is Nick Callums. I'm from the US. Um, I ran the 2023 Sarajevo study trip uh, this past January. My question is going back to your uh, point about having force behind your efforts to have a force backing you up, the fleet metaphorically. Do you feel that when NATO left Bosnia in 2004, I believe it was, and switched to the European peacekeeping force, that the international community lost a lot of leverage because of that? And especially in the years since, as that European peacekeeping force declined to an even smaller number, that there was less of an incentive for politicians like Dodik and other secessionist leaders to adhere to the high representative office or uh, national governments working in Sarajevo? Absolutely. Um, when I was ambassador in Bosnia after the war, there were 60,000 troops, 60,000. And say two years ago, there were 600. Now there are again 1,200, 1,500, yeah. But uh, there were 60,000. And I remember my first trip to, to see my family uh, in January, 96. I had 16 checkpoints, 16, one, six, yeah, or borders, yeah. So there were these peacekeeping troops were everywhere. Not even a mouse could could slip through, you know. So this was very good. And when uh, Lord Ashdown was high representative, there were still 30,000. So he could impose anything. He had a, the troops behind him, you know. But uh, if we have only 600 soldiers and half of them are cooks or drivers, you know, uh, this is not a really strong force, yeah. And um, I had a unpleasant discussion with a person whom I really like and admire. He has, um, he's a brilliant guy, um, Karl Theodor Gutenberg, you know, because of the doctoral thesis, I think he had to, uh, yeah, there were some quotes and quotes, et cetera, yeah. which he didn't quote, yeah. Uh, anyway, he wrote then a doctoral thesis in Cambridge, but in United, he lived in Cambridge in United States later, you know, close to New York, yeah. Uh, so Karl Theodor Gutenberg came to me and he said, uh, Valentin, we have to withdraw the German soldiers. 70 is not much, you know, and to finance 70 is not a big amount, you know. I said, please don't do it. It's so important that Germans are here in Bosnia Herzegovina. It was 2010, yeah. So he said, no, I must remove them. I said, but where will they go? 70 Germans, they will go to Afghanistan, yeah. So nobody noticed in Afghanistan that 70 Germans came to Afghanistan. In any case, he said, there's a decision of the Bundestag, the German parliament decided so. And they left. And then my ultimate punch was, but you can you cannot withdraw German soldiers. There are 20 soldiers from Chile in Bosnia, from Latin America. So Latin America knows what is peacekeeping, but the Germans don't. It was very strange, yeah? Or Sigma Gabriel, uh, foreign minister of Germany, and also High Commas, his successor, they went to Mali because of German troops. Okay, I know there are these French, uh, fr the French are friends, you know, there, there's this NATO alliance and so on. So they went to visit German uh, soldiers now in, uh, in Mali. But they never came to Bosnia. 
They never came to this European country, Bosnia, but they went to Africa. They went to Afghanistan, yeah? So this was a mistake. Now Germans are back, yeah? But I was warning, don't do it, yeah? So, um, and if you have 30,000, including families in South Korea or in Japan, why not to have a few thousand in Bosnia? Because these guys, I'm sorry to say, they only accept force. If you are nice, if you are good, they take goodness as weakness. And they have, they know all the tricks, you know, uh, how to get around foreigners, etc. But uh, if you have an army behind you, then you can negotiate and you can say, okay, there's a deadline, 6th of January. I like to see the results. And they keep it. Yeah. I did it once, yeah, um, but it was in the Security Council. I had uh, I was there 25 times every six months in the Security Council. Yeah, I publicly uh, asked President Dodik to remove uh, a um, plaque, how you call it, um, inscription, yeah? A, plaque, yeah, a plaque, yeah, from a dormitory in Pale, uh, Republika Srpska, devoted to Karadzic, who is a criminal. Who, yeah, he was in charge of genocide in Bosnia Herzegovina. And this dormitory was called Karaji dormitory. So I, I told him and I gave him a, a, a deadline of six months, you know, until the next security council uh, to remove this uh, plaque of Karaji. Yeah. Imagine young people going to the dormitory and they see a plaque of a, of a war criminal. What message is this? But there have been uh, Nobel Prize winners from Bosnia. Ivo Andrich, who ended up in, in Belgrade, you know. Yeah, Ivo Andrich, they could call it a dormitory of Ivo Andrich, yeah. Or there was a second Nobel Prize for chemistry, you know, about uh, stereochemistry. Um, uh, and, uh, but they, they could call it any, anything, but not, or Tesla. Tesla is a good name now, these days, yeah. Yeah, Tesla grew up in Croatia. Uh, he was born in Croatia, but he was a Serb. He was a son of a Serb priest in Croatia, yeah. Call it Tesla, but not Karadzic, you know, yeah. So he removed it, he removed it. But anyway, he's still... Uh, negating uh, genocide. He still thinks Karadzic was a founding father and Mladic, they were founding fathers of Republika Srpska. We should not allow this. No. The West should not allow this. Okay, let me question that. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Faith, I'm from the US. Um, under the Dayton system, we've seen you know political stagnation a lack of reform, and this has really kind of inhibited any advancement toward the EU and the stability that could come with a session. Um, you spoke about the importance of a long-term strategy and especially di preventative diplomacy. Um, so I was wondering what you would view as a long-term strategy for Dayton, the Dayton system in general, um, and if you see any potential changes to the system occurring, you know, proactively. Well, uh, Dayton has to be changed, yeah. Dayton is actually a peace treaty. Uh, it's not a modern constitution. There is constitutional uh, arrangement also, but you have 14 governments, one for yeah? uh, you have uh, uh, you have uh, 14 parliaments. Uh, it's it's crazy, and uh, every parliament can stop everything in a canton, for example. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, Republika Srpska doesn't recognize um, uh, Sarajevo, the state government. Yeah, uh, I mean, of course, we have in Germany uh, an area which is called Free State of Bavaria, Free State. But for them, Berlin is a capital still, still, yeah, despite the name. Or you have, I don't know, 51 or 50 states in the United States, yeah. But they, for them, Washington is also the capital of the state, yeah. In Bosnia, not. So uh, Dayton was, had many weaknesses, you know, and especially Dayton allowed that five people can block the whole state, five people, one member of the state presidency, prime minister or deputy prime minister. And three uh, in the House of People, three deputies in the House. So five people can yeah. block the whole state. And the game the last 30 years was in Bosnia to block, to block, or to say the Minister of Energy must be from my party. Otherwise, there will be no Council of Ministers. In the Federation, you wouldn't believe it. In the Federation, we have for eight years now the same government because they couldn't form, because of blockages, they couldn't form uh, a new government after four years. So the prime minister stayed in power for eight years and the uh, elections were last October and he's still in power in the federation because of the blockages, yeah? So Dayton uh, didn't foresee this uh, because after the war, usually you are building up, you know, you are making a new country. You are not uh, speaking about blockages, yeah? yeah. So there will be 
a new Dayton coming, Dayton 2 or Dayton 3, whatever. And one of your big sponsors, you know, not money-wise, but James Steinberg. James Steinberg, uh, I think he's a... Dean of Steins yeah, Washington. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Greetings to him, please, yeah. James Steinberg made... Uh, in the size, actually. In the size, yeah. <laughs> he made an effort in 2009. He came six times to Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, to change Dayton, yeah, uh, to upgrade Dayton. And you know, the local politicians were very smart. At 10 o'clock in the evening, James Steinberg had to make telephone calls. He was deputy of Hillary Clinton, you know. And you have to, the time difference also helped him. So he made telephone calls after 10 o'clock in the evening, you know. But the local politicians later, when this, uh, his efforts were a failure, you know, when they failed, local politicians said, if he would negotiate until five o'clock in the morning, we would give him some concessions. But he left at 10 o'clock. Maybe this is also a lie, you know, but it's better to, to negotiate the whole night, you know, not to leave the chair. Another lesson, don't stand up when you negotiate, yeah? Yeah, it's important because they will say, oh, he broke the negotiations, you know, just sit, you know. And uh, uh, he came, but however, he came six times, he made six efforts. There were other also, other efforts, uh, maybe four or five to upgrade Dayton. They all failed. So since James Steinberg, 2009, nobody is making an effort because nobody makes, uh, likes to have another failure, you know, yeah. So, uh, but Dayton has to, be, has to be changed, yeah. I don't know, American constitution is also very strange. It never changes. And you still have this one strange uh, institution of co uh, election, uh, how we call it? Electoral college. Electoral college, yeah. It's completely useless. Now you have... Uh, you have these handies and so on. You have internet, you know. Master, don't, 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 <laughs> okay. We open okay. <laughs> box on this. No. Anyway, uh, every constitution has to uh, have some changes, you know. Um, but um, I admire, at the same time, American constitutions. They have so many, so so few amendments. Yeah, so few. Uh, but uh, Dayton has to change. A peace treaty is a peace treaty, and uh, it's not really a, a, a treaty for modern times. Yeah. But it stopped war after hundred thousand people were killed. It's a huge achievement. One of the most uh, successful peace treaties, yeah? Uh, Dayton, yeah. Thank you. Milos. Hi, uh, my oh, name sorry, is, Ruth. oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Hi, my name is Ruth. Uh, I'm from Ireland and I'm a master's student at the University of Bologna. Uh, you spoke about uh, establishing an Erasmus program in the Balkans and potentially uh, a sort of Eurozone uh, agreement in the Balkans. I wanted to ask you about uh, regional integration because that seems to be the, the name of the game, especially about uh, uh, the Berlin summit. And I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on the Open Balkan initiative um, because there's a lot of discussions now that it's either you know complementary to the Berlin process. Uh, there's been about average, I think, 40 initiatives in, in the Western Balkans over the past 25 years. And the Open Balkan Initiative seems to be one of the, the rare ones where it's actually established by the regions, the regional partners. Uh, so I wanted to ask you whether or not you thought it was uh, complementary to the Berlin process or competitive to the Berlin process. I'm pleased that you are from Ireland because um, I think the Good Friday Agreement is maybe two or three years younger than Dayton, yeah? But it was also a huge achievement, again, with international participation. I think there was Tony Blair, there was Bill Clinton. Um, yes, and there was this chief negotiator, what was his name? Um, a famous uh, chief negotiator. Uh, he prepared everything, you know. And, um, and uh, ultimately, Tony Blair and everybody came to sign this uh, Good Friday Agreement, you know. Uh, this is one of the few, very few successes, Good Friday Agreement and Dayton Agreement. After that, I can't remember. Yeah, there was an Iran deal by uh, by, by Ashton, yeah, um, Madame Ashton, and uh, international community didn't do anything in the last uh, many years uh, to have some successful uh, conflict solution. Yeah, uh, as I told much earlier, uh, we are happy with frozen conflicts, so don't touch it. Yeah, but even Cyprus, you have to solve sometime. You know. Uh, and again, it's forgotten, but uh, also Lebanon, you have to solve sometime, you know. I'm, I'm really sorry for Lebanese people, uh, what's going on there, you know. No, for Erasmus, uh, Erasmus, I must say, uh, it was more uh, a PR issue from my side, Erasmus Balkan. Actually, there is now Erasmus Balkan already. It was extended to the Balkans. And there is also this RICO, uh, this uh, Regional uh, Youth Cooperation Council, where thousands of people have been uh, uh, moved from Belgrade to Bosnia and vice versa, you know, to Macedonia, Albania, and so on. 
And this Berlin process, uh, I think it's very good in principle and um, um, it, it should open the Balkans, you know. It's really a pity when you travel the Balkans, when you see uh, kilometers and kilometers of lorries, yeah. yeah, waiting for something, whatever, for a stamp, you know, nothing. There's no real control, but there is a border control. Sure. Yeah. So, and uh, the Berlin process likes to open this. What what disappointed me about the Berlin process is, of course, later it was continued in Vienna, in in Poland, uh, in in Paris, uh, in Trieste, I think. Yeah. What disappointed me, Angela Merkel uh, promised a fast train connection between Sarajevo and um, uh, Belgrade. She promised uh, fast uh, highways. Yeah between Sarajevo and Belgrade and nothing is implemented. Yeah. So if you would give it to, but uh, Erdogan is now starting to build a highway between Belgrade and Sarajevo. He started a thing from the Belgrade side. Yeah. And Turkish construction builders are very good in constructing uh, highways. If you fly over Turkey, you see highways everywhere. Yeah. But anyway, the Berlin process, they promised it, but they did nothing. And the Berlin process is now how much? Six or eight years old, yeah? And there's no highway, there's no uh, fast train. Uh, so um, I'm sorry. Also, I have sometimes the impression that um, the Berlin process, the British German initiative, you know, and so many other initiatives, they are now actually all inside the European Union enlargement, enlargement program, yeah? And about this European Union enlargement promises, I must say, that actually it's a shame because in 2003, there was a Thessaloniki process which was launched yeah, in Thessaloniki uh, in 2003, yeah, once again, 2003. Uh, and they, uh, they gave every Balkan country a European perspective. And now it is 20 years, nothing has happened. Of course, Croatia and Slovenia are inside in the Eurozone and also in the uh, Schengen zone, etc. But all the others are still waiting. And if Bosnia would be in the European Union, say in uh, 33, yeah, in 10 years, which means they have waited for 30 years, yeah. It is like uh, if you can make a heritage, say 100 million for this building, yeah, in 30 years, it's not attractive, yeah, it loses attraction. It's too far away, yeah. Or you can marry somebody uh, in 30 years, yeah. It's not, it's not good because if, if, um, if a promise is 30 years away, it loses on attraction, yeah? It can turn into a Fata Morgana or whatever. And the European Union is losing credibility. If they promise, they have to deliver. I don't say that local politicians uh, have to do something, yeah? They also have to deliver, especially in the area of corruption. And I told you we, too, we should have a brutal approach on rule of law, yeah? But anyway, uh, just nice words is not enough. Yeah, you probably see I'm getting cross-eyed with on enlargement. I keep looking over at Sir Michael Leakman. I'm sure he'll have something to say on this. Milos, and then is it somebody else here? Yeah, Verena. Great, Milos. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Milos. Uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, so I have a bit of a speculative question. Um, insofar as speak louder, yeah. Yes. Insofar as um, I also went to the trip to Sarajevo, and while we were there, I couldn't help but somehow uh, make a link to what's happening in Ukraine right now. And it had me wondering, you spoke about the importance of reusing ideas in diplomacy, and again, speculating, and it's a different situation, but once the war in Ukraine hopefully comes to an end and the immediate negotiations that will take place, can you think of any ideas that should be reused and any that should definitely not be reused from your lessons in, that you've learned in the Balkans? Thanks. Could you repeat the question? Okay, I mean, sort of the lessons learned with regard to the Balkans, no, but how, how could they be applied in Ukraine once the war ends? How would you... Well, there are some um, similita similarities between Bosnia and Ukraine. Also, regretfully on the negative side, like uh, raping women as part of the strategy, uh, then uh, killing people, of course, yeah. There's one difference, of course, a big one is that uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina was forbidden to import weapons. Uh, they could only smuggle weapons into Bosnia. 
and I remember one, my driver in the Austrian embassy, he was uh, painting a chimney in green, yeah, to pretend he has a cannon on his shoulders. He was walking through the through the woods, like to pretend if serfs were looking or anybody, I don't know, that he has a cannon on his shoulder. It was just a chimney, it was empty. And they had, uh, they had um, hunting uh, guns, etc., but not really weapons, you know. But Ukraine is getting a lot of weapons, you know. And um, I think ultimately uh, they will be, um, they have to sit down and to have uh, a solution. But um, Ukraine can only negotiate if they are strong uh, during the negotiations. If they are weak, uh, they will not be respected. And uh, this is why it's important that they get some back some of their territory, whether it is uh, Donbass or Lugansk or Zaporozhye or whatever, I don't know. But they have to go into negotiations uh, as a strong partner. And uh, Putin, on the other side, he, I think he knows he cannot win anymore, but he is not allowed to lose because his personal fate will be at stake if he loses, you know, not of Russia. Yeah. And uh, also the arguments which, which Putin repeated uh, two days ago about the Russian word, yeah, Ruski Svet. Um, there was a German word also, I mean, you know, uh, um, Königsberg, yeah. In Koenig, Königsberg was German, but now it's inside uh, NATO. You have Königsberg, which is Kaliningrad, yeah, between Lithuania and uh, Poland, yeah. So if you speak about historic lands, then I worked for years in Mongolia. Mongols could say we were in Baghdad, Mongols, you know, we were in Lignitz in East Germany, uh, we were in Russia, it's our territory. Uh, we in Austria could also say the South Tyrol in Italy was Austrian. It was Austrian, of course, but then uh, it never stops. Yeah, you have chaos, you have chaos. But I, pr I, I prefer East Tyrol in Austria, North Tyrol in Austria, South Tyrol in Italy. It's one region, it's one region, but we didn't change a millimeter of the borders. And so we can have greater Serbia because there are Serbs living in, in Bosnia, there are Serbs in Croatia, there are Serbs in, in Montenegro, if you like. Yeah, uh, we can have greater Serbia, if you like, but don't change the borders or greater Croatia or greater Bosnia, if you like. Because there are Bosniaks living in Sanjak. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we will see what will be in in in, in Ukraine. I think it will take take a long time. And um, uh, on the other side, we see uh, something similar, like uh, with Ukrainian refugees. Poland took, I think, three million. Germany took at least one million. Uh, in the Bosnia war, we took also many. Austria, hundred thousand. Germany, three hundred thousand. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sweden, of course, etc. Yeah, and they're all successful uh, in their countries. Yeah, but I don't know. We can speak maybe bilaterally if you like to get some more. But definitely, some lessons will be taken from Ukraine. And there is also one lesson, of course, already now. Uh, Russia doesn't like that uh, Bosnia will be in the future or Moldova in European Union or Serbia. Yeah, so they like to have chaos in these countries. They have to like uh, they like to have instability in these countries because European Union doesn't want to import instability. Uh, so instability is important for the Russians. They will not join European Union. Yeah, but now at least these countries are candidates. You know, candidate countries, uh, including Moldova, in, including Ukraine. So this is in a way a marking of a territory. They belong to us in future. Don't mess. Right. Yeah. This actually answers Davide Tabarelli's question, uh, Tabarelli from Nomismo online. Thank you for that question. So I think that's been answered. Uh, Irene? Thank you. Uh, my name is Irene. I'm from Italy. And I wanted to ask you mentioned, you briefly mentioned borders before and, and border management. And um, I wanted to ask uh, what the impact of migration um, has been in, in the Balkans and in Bosnia specifically after 2015, 2017 uh, on the stabilization process in the country and also on the relationship with the EU. Thank you. Yes, uh, first of all, internal migration. There were two uh, million people displaced person in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, and uh, of course, they went to safe areas like to Sarajevo yeah, or to Bihać, etc. Um, we still have maybe a 200,000 or so displaced persons, internally displaced, yeah, but all the others have settled, even including um, in, in, foreign, in foreign countries, yeah, um, like Austria, Germany, Sweden, etc. 
But as far as uh, migration through Bosnia is concerned, yeah, we have had uh, thousands and thousands of uh, migrants, uh, maybe 30, 40, 50,000, I don't know. And we had a resident migrant population of seven or 8,000. Yeah? Of course, they came from a European country, these migrants from Greece. Yeah? <laughs> uh, then they went to Macedonia, from Macedonia to Serbia, from Serbia to Republika Srpska, and then from Republika Srpska to the Federation. And they all went to the border with Croatia. So they could um, somehow cross the borders, you know, and they would end up inside Croatia, but they don't want to stay in Croatia. They like to go to Slovenia, then to Austria or from Slovenia to Italy. This was also a, a migrant route, you know, from Italy to Brennero yeah, and to Germany. And usually these uh, migrants only know two words in the past. One was asylum and second one Merkel, Angela Merkel, <laughs> because they, know, they knew it somehow in Germany it's easier. Yeah, But um, not all of them came from uh, areas where there was war. Yeah, Syria, of course, there was war, but in Pakistan, there was no war. Yeah, and the biggest group recently were Pakistanis, including also, I don't know why, but uh, also from Morocco. There was quite a, quite a number from Morocco. And everybody who is not recognizing Kosovo gets free entry in Serbia. Those who are not recognizing Kosovo have free entry in Serbia. So you can come from Iran, you can come from Morocco by plane, like a tourist. Yeah. And then you go the Balkan route to Germany. This was also interesting here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Here at the front, and then Manuel at the back. And then I think we have someone else. Oh, should... go ahead. Hi, my name is Vanina. I'm from Jamaica. Um, I was also on the trip to Bosnia. And we visited Srebrenica, and we spoke with the mothers of Srebrenica. They basically feel that the international community has failed them and is continuing to fail them, that they sort of live in an area of, you know, still ongoing conflict. They don't feel completely safe. Um, do you think that there is any way that we can reconcile this as the international community, or do you think that the international community should be involved in this? Mothers of Srebrenica are right. I met them many times. These were the most difficult meetings uh, from the moral point of view, emotional point of view, because if uh, a mother has lost 32 relatives, two sons and husband and father, father-in-law, yeah. uh, but this one lady with 32 relatives lost, uh, she was for reconciliation, you know, and she said that Srebrenica is a place where Serbs could come. Uh, Serb nation is a good nation. I, I, I lived in Serbia for four years, you know, but not every individual. Yeah, but so Serbs could come during night, during daytime, alone in groups, whatever, an anonymously, and ask for ask for forgiving uh, in 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 Srebrenica. So this could be a place for reconciliation. Yeah, uh, but these mothers are true. For example, Bosnian language is still um, uh, is still discriminated in the schools in Republika Srpska, yeah. and. Um, International community is doing nothing, including Valentin Insko, you know. There were strikes in front of my office for Bosnian language in, in the Republika Srpska. Yeah? Of course, the language is almost the same, but uh, maybe the Bosnians have, um, in Bosnian language, you have 8,000 Turkish words, yeah? 8,000 Turkish words, which, and we have a few words even in German, you know. We say baklava, we say sandale, limon, limon, you know. Yeah, it's Turkish or Farsi, whatever, you know. Sandale, yeah, such words exist, you know. The Croats don't have a word for kidney, yeah. Slovenians have a word for kidney. So they take the Turkish word, bubreg, you know, uh, and, and so on. But uh, this is a difference, yeah. It's like a difference between uh, German and Austrian. In Germany, they say tomato. We say paradise, paradise, you know. Yeah, but just, tomato, yeah, so, tomato. Yeah. yeah, so, but you have to respect the language. You have to respect it, yeah. Even if it's uh, any language from the Mars, whatever, it's in the constitution, Bosnian language. They have to respect. It's not being respected, you know. But what we did concretely, uh, not as international community, but I got a strange telephone call once from Salzburg from a politician. She told me, Valentin, could you imagine a music school in Srebrenica? I said, you mean two music schools, one for the Orthodox children and one for the Muslim children, yeah? 
She said, no, one music school. So I explored a little bit the situation on the ground and we have uh, established this music school. It's called Music of Good Tones. Yeah. Uh, and um, you have 40% uh, Muslims there. I mean, Muslims to simplify, yeah? Bosniaks and 60% um, Orthodox. And they are playing on 27th of January on the birthday, they play Mozart together. Yeah. And when Francisco Bergoglio, <laughs> with Italian roots, when he came to Sarajevo, the school was playing. Uh, and nobody asked, is the guy on the flute a Serb or is he a Muslim, whatever. No, they were just playing, yeah, uh, together. So it is possible in Srebrenica, they have one music school, yeah. And what was very smart by this Austrian politician, you know, very smart, she said, the biggest room must be the kitchen. Why? It's communication. It's communication, people eat, People are cooking together. And of course, it's the same food. It's the same food, yeah? Uh, from Chewapchichi to Rajnichi to Baklava, it's the same food. There's no Serb food there or uh, Muslim food, yeah? Even in Greece, you have Turkish coffee, etc. They don't like it, but it's Turkish coffee. So uh, this is about communication, yeah? In the kitchen, they communicate. They eat together later, yeah? So it's a big success. Or oh, another big success of the same lady. She was a good politician and a big heart from Salzburg. She introduced, a, you call it circus, circus, circus circo yeah. maximo, yeah, circus, yeah. Um, but this circus was special because he had no, it, it had no artists, no artists. Yeah. So this guy came from Germany and he looked at young children uh, who would be the future artist. Yeah, there was training for ten days, like walking on a rope, you know. Uh, and all these tricks, clowns, etc. Yeah, and um, what was interesting, we thought there would be problems if you take Bosnian children and Serb children. And the first day, somebody really wanted to uh, to uh, put fire on the on the tent, but it was an isolated incident. Yeah. So later, friendships developed, and when a Bosnian boy went, Mustafa went to rehearsal, uh, a Serb boy came with his father by car. And he said, hey, father, this is Mustafa. He goes to the rehearsal. Can he join our car? Can he go with us? And they're friends today. So it's possible. It's possible. But you will never hear all that uh, three Muslims built Catholic churches in, in Bosnia. Herzegovina. You will never hear about it. You only hear about the conflict and uh, politicians who say we cannot live together. It's not true. Dodik is repeating every day we cannot live together. So why in Serbia? You have 16 languages in Serbia, in Vojvodina, 16 languages, yeah, including str a strange language called Ukrainian or Ruthenian, which also uh, the parents of Andy Warhol, you know, Andy Warhol spoke. He was called, when he was born, Warhola, Warhola. His parents came from Eastern Slovakia, and they are, there is a small community of uh, Ruthenian, Ukrainian people, and also in, in Vojvodina, in Serbia. They live together peacefully. And if we cannot live together peacefully, Europe is not possible or America, whatever. Yeah. So don't listen to politicians, but ordinary people. You know, there was this guy plowing his field, and all of a sudden there were so many stones in the in the in the plow. You know, and he looked, and there was the foundations of the oldest Catholic church uh, in Bosnia. A Muslim was plowing his field, so he built a wooden church next to it, next to these oldest foundations. Yeah. And he said, this is our common culture, our common heritage, yeah? a church. So this is Bosnia. Uh, and the last sentence, you know, in 1492, in Spain, Isabella, Catholic and Ferdinand kicked out all the Jews. Yeah, What a mistake from Toledo, from Cordoba, etc. Yeah. Anyway, they were all welcomed in the Ottoman Empire, including Sarajevo. And there were 14,000 living in Sarajevo since 1492, which means 500 years. In other words, this was Europe in a small place. There were four religions, the Orthodox, the, the Islam, Catholic, and also the, the, the Jewish religion. Yeah? They lived together peacefully. So it can be recreated again. But at the moment, it's quite damaged to you know this peaceful coexistence. Manuel, allow me to abuse of my position as chair a second as to, I mean, we go from an optimistic note to to this question. You were talking about laws and whether they've been properly implemented, because of course that's the proof of going from law in the books to, to law in action. 
Now, one of, I think, the most significant laws that were approved under your uh, tenure as, at the high, as high representative was the law on genocide denial. Correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, how how successful is that that piece of legislation been? Because on one hand, you're absolutely right. This 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 is an area where for 400 uh, years, 400 years, people have been able to live together from different religions and so on and so forth. But there are also people today that are denying that a genocide took place in Srebrenica. I come from a country where we had many Nazis, yeah? So we have a law, of course, that everybody who is denying Holocaust must go to prison. And there was one British historian, I don't know, David, he's... David Irvine. Yeah, yeah yes, yeah. he claims to be a historian. He said there was no Holocaust, yeah? So he had to go to prison for three years, yeah? And for me, coming from such a country, it was only normal to have a similar law in Bosnia-Herzegovina about genocide denial, so that nobody could deny uh, genocide, yeah? And in our country, it's also, it happens also, Austrians are doing it. Like a lady was sentenced last year because she, she uh, baked a cake, a cake, a torta. How is it Italian? Torta. Torta, yeah. But on the cake, there were two letters, SS. And she was sentenced. Why? She was sentenced because we have a law. You cannot use uh, Nazi symbols, you know, uh, even on a cake, yeah. And she was stupid, of course, to put it on Facebook. Yeah. Then we had a football player who had on his socks the number 88. Those of you who studied uh, Chinese, you know, this is eternal luck. The number eight is eternal luck, yeah? Anyway, uh, he didn't have Chinese literature, but uh, this is also the eighth letter in alphabet, H, Heil Hitler. So he was also sentenced, you know, using uh, uh, number 88 on his socks, yeah? Because we have a law. And such a law I introduced in Bosnia-Herzegovina because there were now school classes going to Karadzic and Mladic, graffiti or murals or whatever. School classes making pictures, you know, uh, like our founding fathers, Mladic and Karadzic, yeah? Uh, so this was really too much. Also, mothers of Srebrenica told me if I could do something, yeah? And I had to wait for two... Um, uh, second instance uh, decisions in the court in Hague, yeah. Uh, it was for Karadzic because he appealed, of course, yeah. He got a lifelong sentence and it was about Mladic. It was in May 21 and in Ju June I signed this law, you know. Um, and um, now gen genocide denial is forbidden. Of course, genocide was happening also in other places but we have a verdict only on Srebrenica, yeah? So if somebody is denying Srebrenica genocide, uh, and it's, people said I'm anti-Serb, Serb, as I said, they are good people, yeah? But uh, if an Austrian would come to Srebrenica or to Sarajevo and he would deny genocide, he would also be put to prison, not the Serbs, why, yeah? So it's, it's a general law. It's also a copy paste from European directives that you cannot, uh, how is it called? Uh, bagatellize and trivialize yeah war criminals, war, war crimes, yeah. So I just copy pasted this and I did it uh, in my last month of uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I announced it to the international community in an internal meeting. They didn't really believe it. But uh, when my uh, departure approached, I got many nasty telephone calls. Imagine. Valentin, we are with you. Denying genocide is terrible, yeah. Really terrible. And there was also a German diplomat, yeah. We know it from Germany, you know, it's terrible to deny genocide, but don't use bomb powers. You wouldn't believe who called me, you know, very high level people uh, from many places. But I went to Srebrenica to this uh, graveyard of 8,000 young boys and, and men. I checked my conscience, you know, and I had a strange picture. If I wouldn't do it, and if I would die, everybody will die, of course. These 8,000 boys would wait for me, 8,000 skeletons would wait for me somewhere else, yeah, in the other world. And they would tell me, Insko, we don't uh, really criticize you, but we are disappointed. We are disappointed. You had the pen in your hand. You come from Austria. You did nothing. I've seen these skeletons, believe me. Yeah. So I went at 5 o'clock in the morning to Srebrenica. I had a dialogue with these people that I killed people. And at midnight, at 12 o'clock, I signed the, the law. Yeah. And of course, um, the reactions were as expected. 
they lasted a little bit longer, but usually in Bosnia, every bad news uh, or every news lasts for three days. Maybe in Italy is the same, I don't know. But <laughs> after three days, it's forgotten, yeah, or scandals, etc. Then a new scandal comes in. Yeah. yeah, it lasted six months. It lasted six months. And regretfully, but I must say to you in public, yeah, so you have no illusion about uh, some people in Brussels. Regretfully, in an internal meeting, uh, and I read the, I call it the notes to the file, yeah, an internal meeting, Varheli, the Enlargement Commissioner, criticized me by name. It's my fault, it's INSCO's fault that there is uh, uh, destabilization in Bosnia and Herzegovina because of his law which he imposed, yeah. So Vaheli criticized. I'm of course I'm proud of it, yeah. But uh, but um, uh, sometimes, as I told you much earlier, you have to do what is right, yeah. And there's an American proverb: proverb, if you don't know what to do, do the right thing. Manuel, and then Georgia. Uh, hello. We can also discuss in small circles if you yeah. like. Yeah, I'm but, at disposal. But, yeah. I also suggest at this point, since four people are so quick. We can take all four questions together and then we can close. Go ahead, Manuel. Uh, hello, Ambassador. My name is Manuel. I'm a Spanish American student here at SAIS. Um, you spoke earlier about um, Bill Burns and his uh, capacity for languages. And so I was interested if you, uh, either from your work or um, from reading beforehand, um, if you had other diplomats that have inspired your work or you or you greatly admire the the work or the contributions that they have made to, to the field of diplomacy, if you could uh, speak on that. Okay. Hi, my name is oh. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Sophie. Uh, I have uh, two related questions to uh, Doric and succession. Um, so the first one is, if possible, um, can the or can the OS um, OHR remove Doric uh, and why hasn't that happened? Um, the second question is, uh, what are the possible effects of uh, succession, succession if that happens and geopolitically? Okay. Carla and then Georgia and then we'll close. Hello, I'm Carla, I'm from Italy. And I also took part to the Sarajevo trip. And um, earlier, you one of your advices was uh, be ahead of uh, trends. And I was the the trends and my observation uh, on the trip were were three main observations. First of all, a very strong radicalization, especially on the Serb uh, Bosnian side, and then a very slow process of European integration and a very strong uh, migration of young people from the country. I was wondering if these observations, of course, are correct, and what other trends you see ahead. Thank you. Right. Thanks for the great other people question. Georgia. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. I'm Georgia from Italy as well, a uh, second year Maya student. And uh, yesterday, actually, we had a very interesting talk about the EU enlargement in the in the Balkans, and we heard about the EU viewpoint on it. So I was wondering if you could very, I mean, obviously very briefly, but um, mention a couple of practical things that according to you would work in order to relaunch the EU enlargement prospect in the Balkans from the viewpoint of the Balkans and what should be done um, just to, like have a comparative uh, prospect compared to the EU viewpoint. Thank you so much. Right. Okay, can I start with the last question? Sure. Um, the, um, I, I, I watched because I was head of the department for Eastern Europe, I watched the, the enlargement, the big enlargement with 10 countries, yeah, eight Eastern European countries and later uh, also uh, Cyprus and Malta, what was it, I don't know, but uh, yes. there was a fierce competition amongst these countries like uh, Latvia wanted to be better than Lithuania or Estonia, and Slovenia wanted to be the best, you know, they uh, published such a fat book about achievements in Slovenia. Uh, I completely miss such a competition in the Balkans, who is better, yeah? They try to outsmart, to outfox, you know, uh, even European Union, you know, there was everybody, Tusk and there was uh, van der Leyen, everybody was in, in, in Bosnia many times, you know, uh, and everybody got nice promises. They looked into the eyes of van der Leyen and said, we will do it by tomorrow. No, by end of the month, no, 
nothing happened, nothing. So, and the, regretfully, European Union uh, has a policy of, um, of voluntary, uh, how to say, voluntary progress or whatever, you know. And in these countries where there was a fear competition, like in the Baltic countries, yeah, it, it worked. But in, in the Balkans, you have to have sanctions. If you don't uh, deliver by the end of the month a good law against um, corruption, whatever, yeah, or war, wartime strategy, war crime strategy, whatever, you know, we will not, we will stop giving you cohesion funds or whatever. These are huge amounts, hundreds of millions, yeah, or for the last COVID crisis, all the vaccines came free of charge from Brussels, I mean, from European Union, yeah. We will stop giving you money for your roads, etc whatever, you know, but they don't do it. They, uh, if they don't get this, uh, say, corruption law, they extend the deadline. And again and again, this is not good because we are losing also our reputation, you know. Um, then um, who admired my work? I don't know who admired it, but uh, I think Dutch were always supporters of my work, the Dutch. Of course, they had a problem also with um, Srebrenica because there was this Dutch contingent. However, the Dutch were left alone. The Dutch asked for fighter planes, you know, they asked the Security Council to intervene. But I'm sorry to say, because you're young diplomats, but they tell you the truth. In New York, when you get a request from somewhere from Africa, from Asia, or from Bosnia, they go and say, ah, let's have lunch first, you know, uh, let's discuss. But people are dying in Srebrenica. People are being killed in Srebrenica. You can't go for lunch in, in New York, you know. So uh, sometimes it happens, you know, that all these big machineries don't work for weeks and months or days or hours even, yeah? And in the meantime, you have this um, uh, massacre uh, on the ground, yeah? No, the Dutch were always supporting me, the British, uh, Americans, of course, uh, as the biggest nation. Uh, actually, everybody except the Russians, you know, the, uh, the Russians uh, abused me and criticized me by name, including the current ambassador of Russia, uh, in New York, in Benzia. But uh, actually, um, I was quite happy to have a situation every two, uh, two uh, twice a month, yeah, uh, with 14 countries supporting me and one country criticizing me. Yeah. So I, I think I can uh, live with this. Then there was this question of uh, radicalization. It is true. Uh, in Sarajevo, for example, you see not coward women, but uh, they have this, this scarf, you know, um, a shawl, yeah more than in the past, more than in the past. Maybe it's a reaction about uh, disintegration of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, I don't know. But the normal Bosnian citizen was drinking uh, whiskey, uh, alcohol, even was eating some prosciutto, which is pork meat, you know, and which is forbidden. They are very secular Muslims, you know, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, as I told you earlier, they would go to a Catholic mass, especially at midnight for 24th of December. Many They uh, respect uh, Holy Anthony. They really go to Anthony Church in, in Sarajevo to ask for some favors, etc. Uh, Muslims, yeah. So, but uh, there is more Islam now, and uh, it's not yet political Islam, like uh, you see it in Middle East or so. It's not yet. And I'm sorry, because Bosnian Islam was special, and maybe it was the future of Islam, I mean, the global Islam, yeah? Because they Europeanized quite quickly, they Westernized quite quickly, they are very tolerant, you know, and uh, there were mixed marriages going on in Sarajevo and so on. But uh, you can see there is a sort of um, stronger awareness that being a Muslim, you know, uh, going on now. Migration will continue. Uh, people are leaving the country thousands and thousands, usually they go to Germany, and Germany is welcome. The laws are now very favorable for the people coming from such countries, yeah, they're Europeans anyway, yeah. So, um, and in 2070, Bosnia will be an empty country. <laughs> so it will be very ecological, yeah. Um, um, but of course, this trend has to be uh, reversed, yeah. European enlargement, as I said, people cannot wait for 30 years, but uh, they should take some concrete steps uh, especially they should implement European European uh, legislation, directives, etc. And um, the way is very clear and easy. So many countries did it earlier. Of course, it's now much more difficult because uh, in the past you had a few chapters or like GDR, they didn't even have 
Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. But I think there are now 35 chapters to them. Um, yeah. If they would have a will, you know, and it happened once, I was European Union special representative. They had to implement 155 measures to have a visa-free travel. I did it in three months for visa-free travel because everybody profited, be it Serb or Croat or Bosniak, whatever, you know, in three months, 155 conditions. Yeah. Um, yeah, EU would be the future for me. This common umbrella would give everybody the possibility to be whatever, Serb or Croat or Bosniak, cross borders, borders are invisible in the European Union. Uh, yeah, yes, about external borders, about migration. They should be actually somewhere in Greece, I think, yeah. Uh, Greece, Macedonian border somewhere in the Mediterranean. Regretfully, Mediterranean is the biggest grave in Europe, yeah. But one question I didn't quite understand, can OHR, I think you asked, yes. can do OHR do what? Remove the Scottish. Yes, yes, yes. We have removed 200 politicians, including three state presidents. But you know, if I would do it, or my successor, Schmidt, he would have to have complete united international community behind him, a fleet behind him, yeah? Sure. The international community. And you know what usually uh, careful and clever diplomats would say? Clever, yeah. Oh, Valentin, we know he deserves it, yeah? But there would be destabilization. Don't do it. So he gets away with murder, yeah? Yeah, and his, one of his famous sentences was, and he got away also, his famous sentences was around Brexit. He said, goodbye, Bosnia, welcome RS Brexit, Republika Srpska Brexit, yeah. And nothing happened, yeah. Master, Regretfully. Diplomats that have inspired you, and then we can close. Any diplomats apart from Burns that have inspired you in the course of your... Who has inspired me? Yes. Yeah, also. definitely Bill Burns. Yeah, Bill Burns is a big example of, of a modern diplomat. Yeah. I think Steinberg also is a very good diplomat. Yeah. I liked also Hillary Clinton. I met her three or four times. I met President Clinton five times. Yeah. They are quite, also British diplomats, uh, some French, they are quite impressive. Not everybody. Yeah. But for example, I had a close relation with uh, Kushner, Bernard Kushner. He was really a lively the diplomat, and he has a big heart, you know. When his mother died, he was 98, yeah, she was 98. He sent me an SMS, my mother died. So for him, it was important, not only Kosovo and the Balkan politics. He came to Srebrenica also, you know. But when his mother died, he told me. So, of course, I expressed condolences and so on, yeah. Uh, there are such people. And one is remarkable, but you will, you will maybe not think about him. Invite him here, maybe, yeah. The foreign minister of Luxembourg, he is a clever guy. He is, I think, 15 or 20 years foreign minister. He is smart, you know. He speaks every language, you know. And he uh, knows who the politicians in the Balkans or Eastern Europe are, crooks, and uh, that they are corrupt, etc. You cannot tell him any story, you know, uh, or fairy tale. He knows whom he's speaking to. Um, the foreign minister of Luxembourg. I really... Ad and of course, he had time to have lunch with me, etc. In in his residence, you know, in 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 Luxembourg. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, we'll take that bit of advice and invite maybe invite him, Ambassador Inscott. Thank you very much indeed. That's it. Thank you, everyone, to so those of you online as well. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.